Hello, my name is uh, David Che. I'm an assistant uh, professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics uh, here at the uh, University of Maryland School of Public Health. And it's my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Carolyn Miller. Uh, Carolyn Miller is a senior program officer at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation in the Research Evaluation, Evaluation and Learning Unit. And one of the reasons uh, I was asked to introduce Carolyn is because I myself was a beneficiary of the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Specifically, I was a part of the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program. And one of the aims of this program was to train a cadre of leaders in health ecology who address multiple levels of influence on the health of individuals, communities, and populations ranging from broader macro level social determinants of health down to the cellular and molecular level. And through my participation, I was given the opportunity to work with preeminent leaders across scientific disciplines, including notables such as Leonard Syme, a pioneer in the field of social epidemiology who was elected to uh, the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences, and Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for her work on telomeres, indicators of our age at the cellular level. The Health and Society Scholars Program is just one example of the innovative and creative programming that characterizes the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. The Research Evaluation and Learning Unit specifically is aimed at expanding the evidence around key health issues. Carolyn Miller brings to the foundation a long and diverse career in private sector government and academic research. She views her work with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation as quote, an incredible opportunity to be part of guiding and supporting the research efforts of the foundation as it helps to move our nation toward a culture of health. Previously, as the principal of Carolyn Miller Consulting, Carolyn provided quantitative and qualitative research for commercial and academic research organizations, foundations, nonprofit organizations, and professional and medical specialty associations. Prior to building her own consulting practice, she held research positions with Mathematica Policy Research, the Gallup Organization, and Princeton Survey Research. Her research has spanned a range of issues in health and healthcare, public policy, public opinion, and survey research methodology. Carolyn received her BA in sociology from the University of Vermont, her MA in Applied Social Research from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor, and her MS in Health Policy from the Thomas Jefferson University School of Population Health in Philadelphia. This morning, she'll be talking about a framework and measures to building a culture of health. With that, let's all give Carolyn Miller a warm welcome. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you all here today on day two of National Public Health Week. Thank you so much for this opportunity to talk to you about the Foundation's vision to build a culture of health. I think the culture of health vision really aligns well with the theme of this meeting, from community engagement to population health. And I hope to highlight some of those connections as I take you on a quick tour of the development of the Culture of Health Action Framework, as we call it, the 41 national level measures that are associated with the framework, and some of the other research we're doing to further build the evidence base for a culture of health. As this quote from our president and CEO, Risa Lavisa More, suggests, a culture of health means providing every person with an equal opportunity to live the healthiest, most fulfilling life possible, no matter who they are, where they live, or what their physical challenges happen to be. It means recognizing that health is an essential part of everything we do. It's the bedrock of personal fulfillment and the backbone of prosperity. Now, we recognize that health means many things to many people. A culture of health respects and honors the diversity of our population and the importance of our family and ethnic traditions. All of us who have been part of this work to build a culture of health have done so in response to this important question. What is holding our nation back? What's holding us back from living in communities where everyone has equal opportunity for good health, 
from seeing all children grow up at a healthy weight, or from attaining the highest quality health care for our investments? What do we know from good evidence but need to scale and spread? And where do we need better research and information and understanding to determine effective actions? As we conducted the research that supported developing the culture of health framework, it became clear that we as a nation are not addressing the interdependence of the many social, economic, physical, and environmental factors that greatly influence health and well-being. Sorry, I'm a little ahead of myself. <laughs> Building a culture of health requires us to identify and encourage shared meaning and expectations. As we shared our initial ideas for building a culture of health in discussions with experts, partners, community members, and global leaders, we saw that many of the same goals that we're advancing through the culture of health framework are broadly shared if called by different names. Goals to achieve health equity, to improve access to high quality, efficient health care, to ensure more people get the preventive and social services they need, to encourage an emerging, broader view of health. We also saw a need to focus on these shared goals and expectations and highlight our capacity as individuals and as communities and as a society to promote individual and community well being to create the physical and the social environments that prioritize health, and to support access to opportunities for healthy lifestyles and quality health care for everyone. So why this, why now? We've seen two forces at play that we believe set the stage for and drive the momentum towards a culture of health. First, improvements in health and well-being have been happening in some places and for some people. But these improvements are simply not keeping pace with outcomes that really need to change and are not being realized broadly enough across population groups and geographic boundaries, particularly considering the money and the time spent. Second, this frustration comes at a time when there is more of a platform to finally embrace the WHO definition of health, to consider well-being, to understand the many social, economic, and environmental factors that influence health, particularly in a post-ACA world. In that context, those two gears started in motion the movement that underlies the culture of health. A group of us in the Research Evaluation and Learning Unit, under the leadership of Dr. Alonzo Plow, who's familiar to many of you, I think, were tasked with defining and operationalizing this broad construct of a culture of health. Working in partnership with the team from the RAND Corporation, we first focused on framing what a culture of health means, both in defining culture and health separately and then together. But we also had to operationalize that definition into something actionable, the framework, and build out details like illustrative measures and plans for how the framework would be applied nationally and locally. The goal here was to ensure that with this action framework and 41 national measures, we're ultimately sparking new dialogue about health among multiple sectors highlighting through the illustrative measures the information and data systems necessary to track, measure, and ultimately value the many different aspects of health and well-being. Using these insights to help inform health and well-being investment and, and not simply health care investment. So here's the action framework. It represents a set of national priorities we think are necessary for building a culture of health. And it reflects an understanding that addressing the challenges that impede our ability to reach our health potential and achieve health equity requires all of us, institutions, individuals, and sectors, to think and work differently. We need to recognize that strategies to improve health by focusing just on the health care system are insufficient. Building a culture of health requires action within and across sector because progress in one area will advance progress in another. The framework seeks to catalyze conversations and provide guidance on where to focus. So as you can see, the framework is grounded in four interconnected action areas that show improved population health, well-being, and equity, the outcome area in the middle, as the sum of many parts. An important thing to note about the framework is that equity and opportunity are overarching themes and are woven into all of the action areas. 
Achieving health equity is a critical compo component of everything we do, and we understand that we cannot build a culture of health in this country if some are left behind and face steep and stubborn, stubborn bar barriers to health. We'll work to bring to light new research to more clearly identify and address the root causes of health inequity. Now, there's a reason we call it an action framework and not an action model. To us, model implies something that is formulaic, fixed, and final, a, bl a blueprint that should be followed. Framework speaks to a built-in fluidity, an opportunity to utilize the structure, to personalize it, and to run with it. We want this framework to provide entry points that resonate with the goals and values of many individuals, communities, and organizations. The framework was designed to build on the energy and the insights of those working in the health sector for years, but it also opens the door to new allies, especially those who haven't seen themselves as having much to do with health until now. The action framework will guide the foundation's investment over the next 20 years. We'll fund work in each action area, but not in every aspect of the four. We're just one of the many organizations working toward the common cause of improving health in America. So I'd like to talk a little bit about the structure of the framework. As you saw on the previous slide, the framework includes four action areas and the outcome area. What you don't see on that slide is that each area includes three sub-dimensions, or drivers as we call them. The four action areas are very broad, making health a shared value. There are many aspects to that action area. So we broke down each action area into a set of drivers. Drivers indicate where our nation needs to accelerate change within that action area. And we think of these drivers as the engine of the framework. These are the long-term priorities we see as necessary to see real movement in the action area at the national and the community level. By calling them out, we begin the conversation and catalyze action in these important aspects of the action area. Each action area is accompanied by a set of national measures rigorously selected as points of, of assessment and engagement. Across the entire framework, we selected 41 national evidence-based measures that are in themselves calls to action. The measures were selected to catalyze a national dialogue, to broaden our view of health, and to inspire action toward improving health. Now, by design, the measures are not limited to traditional health indicators. Instead, they encourage us to think of health in broader ways, incorporating all aspects of well-being. These 41 measures are focused on the national level progress we view as necessary to achieving a culture of health. The measures will illustrate progress and evolve over time to keep pace with changing conditions, availability of new data, or progress in a particular area. The action framework, the action areas, and the drivers are the enduring contribution. The measures will change over time. So I'd like to quickly go through each of the action areas and the drivers and call out a couple of the example measures that we have under that action area. As I said, there are a total of 41 measures, so I can't go through all of them. Um, but you can find the full list of measures, the action framework, uh, all of the supporting documentation about the measures and the process we went through to develop the framework at cultureofhealth.org. So here's action area one. It's about making health a shared value. This action area emphasizes the importance of individuals, families, and communities in prioritizing and shaping a culture of health where health is truly a shared value. So the drivers here shown at the bottom are mindset and expectations. Are we prioritizing and promoting health and well-being? Our outlook on health influences the decisions we make at every level, as individuals, families, communities, and as a nation. Do we recognize how our health affects the health of others and vice versa? And do our policies reflect our community's needs and values? The second driver is sense of community. Do we have the social connections that allow us to thrive? Research suggests that individuals who live in socially connected communities with a sense of security and belonging and trust have better health and are more likely to thrive. If people don't feel connected to their community, they're less inclined to engage in health-promoting behaviors or work together for positive change. And finally, civic engagement. Are we participating in activities that advance the public good? 
In a healthy community, residents take an active role. Civic engagement creates healthier communities by developing the knowledge and the skills to take collect collective action to improve quality. One of our example measures, one of our measures in this action area is volunteer engagement. The percentage of adults and young people 15 or over who report volunteering in the past 12 months. Now, civic engagement may seem odd for a health foundation to prioritize. One example of related work here may help make clear why this is important. People in this room recognize how important youth and their voices are, as we just heard in the previous presentation, and this notion has not been overlooked in the philanthropic community. We've partnered alongside other foundations with the Funders Collaborative on Youth Organizing to advance youth organizing as a strategy for social change. It's critically important as we build a culture of health to include youth voices when developing solutions. Action area two, fostering cross-sector collaboration to improve well-being. This action area focuses on collaborations that include sectors typically seen as outside health and health care. Cooperation across sectors like education, business, transportation, and community development can play an essential role in building a culture of health. The driver tier, first one, is number and quality of partnerships. How many organizations are working together across sectors and seeing successful outcomes? A culture of health calls for effective partnerships, yet research indicates that building relationships among partners is one of the most challenging aspects of creating change. We need to learn more about how to create successful cross-sector collaborations to, to achieve improved health and well-being across entire communities. Investment in collaboration. Is there adequate financial support to enable more of these partnerships? Policies that support collaboration. Are there systems and incentives in place to encourage health as a mutual goal on an ongoing basis? Policies can play a key role in encouraging and maintaining collaboration across sectors, as well as creating incentives for different sectors to contribute what they can to the cause of improving our nation's health. One of our measures in this area is local health department collaboration from the NACHO Profile Survey. This measure looks at how local health departments are collaborating with other sectors in each of the public health program areas. Now this is an example of a measure that will change as we move to a measure that tells us more about the type of collaborations in addition to the number of sectors included. Another measure that I'll call out just because of the previous presentation is youth exposure um, to, TV and to TV advertising for healthy and unhealthy foods and beverages. Action area three focuses on creating healthier, more equitable communities. The places where we live, learn, work, and play all contribute to our ability to become and stay healthy. And while personal choice and responsibility play a part in well-being, the choices we make are based on the choices that we have. Built environment is, one of the, is the first driver here. How do our physical spaces support our well-being? The built environment is critical to a community's well-being. Health-promoting environments are safe, affordable, and provide access to exercise and nutritious food. Social and economic environment. What are the social and communal factors that contribute to wellness? Our social environments, such as enduring racial and socioeconomic uh, segregation, influences health and a community's sense of trust and cohesion. In addition, research points to strong connections between our environment, economic vitality, and health. Policy and governance. Do we have policies that support everyone to live their healthiest life possible? Too often, we see health-promoting initiatives fall short without the policy structures in place to sustain them. A few example measures in this area are housing afford affordability. The percent of families spending 50% or more of monthly income on housing costs for mortgage or rent. We also have the prevalence of com complete streets policies and the percentage of youth who feel safe walking to and from school. And that brings us to action area force, which focuses on strengthening the integration of health services and systems. In a culture of health, we aim to balance medical treatment with public health and social services. This means examining the role of healthcare as part of a larger network and deepening the connections with a broader set of partners. It also means that we address the reality of patients' lives that directly influence health outcomes and costs. 
the drivers here are access. Is comprehensive, continuous care available to all who need it? Access goes beyond simply having insurance. Access must be defined more broadly as ensuring that all people have continuous, comprehensive care, as well as the opportunity, the information, and the tools to make healthier choices. Consumer experience. How do patients feel about their health care and outcomes? Consumer experience can influence whether patients delay or seek care. In a culture of health, health care providers help patients thrive through quality care. It means that patients are actively engaged in decision making and providers are responsive to cultural and linguistic needs. And balance and integration. Are prevention, medical care, and social services working together? A culture of health calls for better balance between prevention and acute care services, as well as the intentional integration of public health, social services, and health care systems. An example measure here is the ratio of annual social spending to annual health care expenditures. This is just one example of the measures that help us focus on equity issues as the social spending part of this equation is clearly focused more on vulnerable populations. It's also an example of a measure that we expect to evolve over time as we do more work to understand the balance that we're seeking between these types of expenditures. And finally, that brings us to the outcome measure, improve population health, well-being, and equity. The outcome area reflects the population health and well-being outcomes of the four action areas. We expect to see improvements in access to care and population health outcomes, economic benefits, and indicators that health and well-being are flourishing within all demographic, social, and geographic populations. We also expect the changes in these outcomes will reinforce the value of health and health care, increasing the value people place on health for, for all Americans, and the importance of multi-sector partnerships to achieve the changes that we need to see. Here the areas are enhanced individual and community well-being. To what extent are people able to realize their full potential for well-being, both individually and as communities? Managed chronic disease and reduced toxic stress. How well are we able to treat chronic health conditions and stress levels across populations? And reduced health care costs. Is there a better balance that we can strike between our spending on health care and our nation's health? One of the measures in this area is the percent, of, the percent of 0 to 17 year olds with one or more reported ACEs scores as reported by their parents. Now ACEs are increasingly getting more attention and we were excited to see media attention that a 20 year old uh, retrospective study funded by RWJ and published in uh, July 2015 issue of the American Journal of Public Health received. And researchers found that kindergartners' social skills were linked to outcomes, both positive and negative, decades later in early adulthood. Kindergartners who share, cooperate, or help other kids are more likely to go to college and have a full-time job. In contrast, students with weaker social competency skills were more likely to drop out of high school, abuse drugs and alcohol, and need government assistance. And the children most likely to struggle socially and emotionally are those who have experienced violence, abuse, or other traumatic events in their early years. So now I'd like to switch gears a little bit and talk about another exciting project that we've launched to examine how a culture of health is emerging and progressing in local context. As I said earlier, the 41 measures that are associated with the action framework provide a way for us to gauge how we're doing at a national level. But we all know that local context is extremely important for understanding community level health and well being. So, we've selected a group of 30 communities across the country that we will observe and follow for at least five years to see how they're addressing community health needs and developing a culture of health. These communities are diverse in terms of size, type, socioeconomic, and demographic characteristics. And they all approach health and well-being from different perspectives and with different strategies. A few important things to highlight about this project. We're not going into these communities with program intervention or grant funding. 
We're observing them. We'll be using a surveillance approach, collecting data and information to paint a rich and detailed picture of each community's journey toward a culture of health. We'll be doing some primary data collection in the sites, but mostly we'll be um, gathering and compiling existing data. We'll also be looking across similar communities to surface common themes and lessons and insights about successes and challenges. So we'll be looking across the group of communities we have that are rural or across the urban communities to see what we can learn about those common issues and challenges that they're facing. Now, per participation as a Sentinel community is agnostic to past, present, or future RWJ funding. So some of our communities have received funding in the past. They are not um, prohibited from getting funding in the future from us or from anybody else. We really want to uh, observe what's happening in these communities. And we really see this as a proof of concept of the action area, of, of the action framework. Does the work going on in these communities map to our action framework, the action areas, and the drivers? Now, as you can see by the map, if you can see the map, uh, the communities are fairly well distributed across the country. We have a few states, we have some uh, rural communities, rural counties, we have some cities, we have a tribal nation, a region of a Midwest state. Um, we've listed all of these communities on the Culture of Health website, and sometime this summer we'll be posting our first snapshot reports for each of these communities. Now these communities will be followed later in the year by more detailed reports for each community that really dives deeper into what kinds of activities are going on in the community, what health and well-being issues they're facing, how they're addressing those uh, issues, who's working together to address those issues. And we'll also be uh, later in the year posting on our website, on the cultureofhealth.org website, some of these cross-cutting theme reports that we hope to, that uh, will emerge as we start doing the analysis of what's going on in the different communities. Another area of RWJ work that may be of interest to this audience, um, as you may know, the foundation has launched three research programs as a central part of our commitment to exploring what it takes to build a culture of health. We call these our action programs, evidence for action, systems for action, and policies for action. E for A, as we call it, is based at the University of California, San Francisco, and it takes applications on a rolling basis. E for A will fund innovative, rigorous research to address the key determinants of health, assess outcomes, and identify priorities for action with a particular focus on research that will help advance health equity. Systems for Action is based at the University of Kentucky and will support research into systems and services that are needed to create a culture of health. This program will focus on building the evidence base around how to connect the healthcare, public health, social services, and community sectors into a broader constellation of delivery and financing systems that support a culture of health. This program has just launched three collaborating research centers at Arizona State University, Indiana University, and the University of Chicago. And we're in the process of evaluating um, applications for, um, for uh, individual research projects that we'll be launching later this summer. And our next CFP for this project will be early in 2017. And finally, Policies for Action it is, is administered through the National Coordinating Center at Temple University Center for Health, Law, Policy, and Practice in collaboration with three research hubs at NYU, University of Michigan, and the Urban Institute. Policies for Action will develop research that generates actionable evidence to guide policymakers, public agencies, educators, advocates, community groups, and individuals. It will examine established laws, regulations, and policies, as well as potential new policies and approaches. And they will have a, a new CFP coming out in early 2016 as well. Now, all of these programs will be engaging researchers in fields we have not traditionally worked with, and we'll be exploring innovative methodologies for measuring population health outcomes. And we hope we'll encourage that sort of multi-sector partnerships that are so important to building a culture of health. We also have four new advancing change leadership programs that will engage multiple fields. Health policy research scholars, which is based at Johns Hopkins University, 
interdisciplinary research leaders at the University of Minnesota, clinical scholars at UNC Chapel Hill, and culture of health leaders um, at the National Collaborative for, Healthy, for Health Equity. So finally, what does a win look like here? Or what are some of the early signs that we're headed in the right direction? First, as I said, we hope to change the conversation around health and well-being to focus on the broader conceptualization of health, more discussion around the fundamental value of health and the need to prioritize health for everyone. We anticipate action around how we invest in health and well-being, both in terms of programs and activities, as well as workforce development and training. And assessment, changing what we measure. This includes our approach to research, our use of data, supporting the data and information infrastructure necessary to share and turn data into information, making research findings widely, widely available and useful to policymakers, community members, and other stakeholders on the ground who are promoting this change. For our part, as a leading philanthropy and proponent of this vision, the framework serves as a guide to all aspects of our work, from the issues we focus on, to the types of research we fund, to how we approach program development and evaluation. At the same time, we're well aware that we're just one organization and building a culture of health will take unprecedented collaboration. We recognize that building a national movement toward better health is not a short-term initiative. It's going to require cultural shift that may take a generation or more to achieve. And it will take time and determination and above all, the continued input of many. So. Thank you all very much. We take some questions. One or two questions. Okay. Thanks for that um, oh, sure. lovely talk. Um, so, do folks uh, have questions for Carolyn Miller? Yes, yes, sir. I, I noticed that you had uh, Persian and rural as two sectors in your manual. What about the geographic, religious, economic sort of uh, planting uh, you know, uh, Now that we're interested in urban communities, urban rural communities, you know, from which they start sort of the same kind of education and adaptation as others. Do you mean within the Sentinel Community Project that I was talking about? We have, um, we, the smallest area I think we have are small rural counties and we have small cities. Um, we will be looking at very deeply into what those areas are doing and if they have particular initiatives that are targeting specific areas of the, of the city, specific neighborhoods and such. So as we gather more information from each of these communities and really see from multiple perspectives, um, not just public health, not just healthcare, but we're gonna be um, interviewing key stakeholders in the community to really find out what kinds of initiatives are going on. So we hope to highlight some of the issues and challenges that are faced by particular neighborhoods and communities in those areas that we're looking at and surface those as well. Yep. Dr. Quinn. Sitting on a, a campus that includes a whole variety of disciplines and working with our colleagues up at University of Maryland, Baltimore. So how, based on what RWJ is trying to do in terms of creating this culture of health, how would we train our students differently? Be they public health students, urban planning students, medical students, law students? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So. Um, I think what we're hoping to see is training that includes <coughs> cross-discipline training. So making sure that public health students are, are interacting with and possibly taking classes or learning about criminal justice or allowing more of that flexibility to look across disciplines to try and understand what's going on. And we hope that with some of our cha uh, advancing change leadership programs, 
um, several of which emphasize or encourage um, multi multidiscipline teams to apply together, that as we encourage that going on at, at maybe a faculty level or a provider level, that, it will, that they will start bringing in students. One of our, um, one of our uh, programs is also for first or second year doctoral students, and it encourages them as well to look at this um, cross-sector work. Yes, uh, back there. Thank you, that was fantastic. Um, I often zone out after about 10 minutes, but you held my attention okay. <laughs> the entire time. Um, to your last point, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on how to disseminate research more widely. I know we've had conversations in our department about um, how you publish in academic journals and you get tenure, but nobody ever takes up your research. Um, and aside from doing things like publishing co-ops and mainstream media sources, I was just wondering if you had any other thoughts. Well, that's been a, um, that's one of the areas that we're also very interested in. And part of um, our recent CFPs have included a specific section about translation and dissemination and what, what is the plan for this. And some of the things, um, I, I'm the program officer for the Systems for Action program, and I know that um, Kentucky has a very active website, um, and they do a lot of um, research in progress webinars where um, different groups that, different ones of our grantees have a webinar to just kind of tease the interest and say this is where we are in our project, this is the preliminary information that we're finding, these are the kinds of things that are going on. We're also encouraging not just the peer-reviewed uh, journal articles, but um, doing other uh, types of pr presentations at conferences and special reports or issue briefs um, and making it more um, widely available. Also, I think with some, as we move forward and try and bring together um, academics, community workers, social workers, schools of public health, as we bring these folks together, we're really hoping that the network of how you um, disseminate your research just grows because, for instance, many of those people aren't so focused on peer-reviewed journal articles but have other ways that they want to translate and disseminate their information. So by pulling these different groups of people together, we're hoping that that expands the network and the ways in which we disseminate those findings. Great. That'll be our last question.